Welcome to Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be anterior cervical discectomy infusion for stenosis with intraoperative neuromonitoring changes. Unfortunately, the audio was corrupted during the conference with the group today, so I had to re record the conference. It's, this case is an 84 year old woman with neck pain and left upper extremity pain. She had symptom onset several months before I saw her that radiated into her left arm, left ulnar form, into her left thumb and left index finger. Everything was left-sided. She had no right-sided symptoms. So left-sided thumb, index finger, which is consistent with the C6 nerve root. She had a similar problem 18 years ago, which was treated with traction. She saw a primary care physician was given two rounds of steroid packs and delauded. She has very severe pain. Her past medical history was, uh, in general, non-contributory. She works, uh, she is a retired nursing assistant. She lives alone and has very supportive children. She has a grocery delivered, but she does her own cooking, her own cleaning. She's right hand dominant. She uses a wheeled walker for the last five or six years and she walks with a bent forward posture. On exam, she keeps her neck flexed, which was very interesting. She has no significant motor deficits. She does have left shoulder pain and left shoulder impingement. She tends to keep her neck flexed and forwards. So out of all these postures, she looks more like the alignment on the right side. X-rays of her left shoulder showed some mild osteophyte formation, but the joint looked okay. And on a physical examination, her pain was not recreated with range of motion of her shoulder. This is a side view, a lateral view of her cervical spine. As you can see, her head is forwards and she is almost horizontal to the ground. C5, C6, and C6, C7 had decreased disc height and large anterior ossifites. C4, C5 does have several millimeters of spondylolisthesis, otherwise the spine looks normal. When she flexes forwards, this spondylolisthesis at C4, C5 does not change. So basically she does have some hypermobility above a very stiff segment from C5 to C7. Extension shows that the C4, C5 spondylolisthesis reduces and the alignment looks about the same. On the AP view, there are large ossifites emanating from the facets from C3 to C7 and you can see the facet joint on face because of the alignment of her cervical spine and the, the angle goes right through the facets because she's basically um, leaning forwards. The oblique views are not contributory. T1 weighted images show tiny bit of panis at C1, C2, decreased disc height, C5, C6, and C6, C7 with some posterior disc osteophyte complex. Spinal cord has some level of compression at C5, C6, and C6, C7 due to this arthritic process. The remaining portion of the spinal canal and spinal cord are relatively normal. Axial cuts C7, T1 are normal. Spinal cord is normal area. Framings are open. C6, C7 has mild flattening of the spinal cord and bilateral femoral stenosis mild C5, C6 I think is her worst level where she has a left side disc herniation compressing the spinal cord asymmetrically on the left causing some central stenosis, bilateral foramenal stenosis. This is at the level of the pedicle of C5 where you can see what I think should be her normal spinal canal. C4, C5 centrally is open, some mild foramenal stenosis. C3, C4 has some right sided foramenal stenosis but she has no right sided neck pain so I do not think this is clinically significant. C2, C3 is normal. so. Basically, in essence, an 84-year-old woman with left upper extremity pain, C6 dermatoma distribution uh, in character. Uh, she has uh, some thoracic kyphosis. She keeps her cervical spine flexed. So in these cervical stenosis cases, uh, I prefer the glide scope for the anesthesia team. Basically, this guarantees that there will be very limited motion of the head and neck to avoid any kind of spinal cord injury. Uh, neuromonitoring was used. These are some deltoid uh, needles, scalp needles, ulnar nerve needles, median nerve needles, deltoid needles, C5, triceps, C7, posterior tibial nerve, S1. Uh, here are the neuromonitoring in the corner. So to be able to access the cervical spine, you need extension like the view on the left. Uh, if the head and neck is flexed, it's impossible to do the operation. Again, our patient had a posture similar to this, and she did have kyphosis of the thoracic spine. 
here is, is this is not the patient herself but a very similar setup that I do a, a roll posterior to the scapula this this roll is a little bit more superior than the scapula the, the arms tape down to the side to remove the arms from the x-rays and extension of the neck so during our conference we had the intraoperative neuromonitoring uh, team discuss uh, the leads and uh, what they do basically uh, she's getting baselines here and basically she measures um, the peak to trough um, for each nerve root so this is uh, intraoperative findings basically uh, she, we position the patient put her to sleep and I went out to wash my hands it was during uh, the time that I was washing my hands that the neuromonitoring started to go out basically the left arm went out and then both legs went out and she should have a um, peak and trough that's similar to this and it was basically flat line first in the left arm then both legs so I was uh, called back um, to the operating room to reposition her and basically I just flexed the neck and we increased the blood pressure and you can see the monitoring was flat during the beginning of the case and then after repositioning the monitoring became normal with a normal um, um, peak and val valley so I just want to go over neuron monitoring what's a neuron a neuron, neuron is the basic cellular structure of the neurological system it has a body and um, uh, at the very end um, the other side is a, a synapse and the current goes up and down the nerve due to the calcium, due to the potassium, sodium uh, um, channels. It depolarizes the cell membrane and it gives off a current. So you can measure this current in two ways, SSAP, somatosensory book potentials, where you constantly stimulate the distal end that goes to the spinal cord and you record it at the scalp. Or you can do the opposite, transcortical motor book potentials, where you stimulate the brain and then you can record it at the feet and this basically tells you that there's a current that goes up and down the spinal cord which is intact if the neuromonitoring changes these are the steps to see what's wrong you can use technical uh, you can evaluate the technical uh, aspect of it the needles did they come out are they not working right or in the wrong place uh, physiologically the first thing is probably to elevate the blood pressure as a patient anemic needs a blood transfusion oxygen saturation has to be increased hypothermia halogens uh, this is by the anesthesia team positional um, uh, first thing is to make sure that the head uh, is possibly extended which can make things worse shoulders uh, may be uh, um, compressed from the uh, traction from the tape or the extremities and then intraoperative surgical things is an implant compressing the spinal cord was the spinal cord or neurological elements traumatized and sometimes you could have a reperfusion injury from decompressing the spinal cord so neuromonitoring is basically a test uh, and this diagram basically goes over sensitivity specificity positive predictive value and negative predictive value so the disorder is basically a neurological injury and the positive test result is changes in the neuromonitoring and in neuromonitoring you can frequently have false positives like this man uh, is told by his doctor you're pregnant and obviously it's a false positive and it's negative and sometimes false negatives which are terrible too like this woman is telling this patient who's obviously pregnant you're not pregnant we have a, a list um, a checklist to go over anytime there's there's neuromonitoring lead changes and this is very important because the surgeons the anesthesiologists everybody's very busy thinking about the case it's good to have a checklist just to go over everything one by one make sure you're not missing anything as to why there's a problem Stegnera testing was basically the first neuromonitoring that we had we basically woke patients up um, to do this preoperatively we would have to uh, uh, practice the Stegnera test can you squeeze my hands move your feet up and down at least three or four times and then wake them up slightly during surgery so that they can move their feet to make sure everything's intact the problem with this wake-up test is there are obvious risks the patient can move the patient can extubate themselves um, one of my favorite tests is the Hoppenfeld ankle clonus test intraoperatively this was developed by 
Dr. Hoppenfeld in New York with 1,000 patients for spinal fusion for scoliosis. And while the patient was being lifted up out of anesthesia, they would do a clonus test. If the patient had clonus in both feet, it was basically proof that the spinal cord was intact and there was no neurological injury. If there was no clonus, you can't tell, but there may have been a spinal cord injury, but sometimes it's an anesthesia problem. So this test uh, does have uh, many false positives. In other words, quite often you don't get any clonus and it's just a matter of the anesthesia. But if you do have clonus, it tells you that everything's okay at the end of the case. This is a study for the journal Neurosurgery Spine 2009, the Resnick study, which basically it was a review of the literature, and the goals were to answer two questions. Does intraoperative monitoring abnormalities predict postoperative deficits, and does it increase safety or efficacy? They went through the literature from 1966 to 2007 and went over 39 references, and they found that there was no information in all these studies that the interventions that were done during the surgery were efficacious. In other words, the things that the surgeon did helped with the neurological outcome. This is another study from Hadley in 2017. And this is the same thing, review of the literature. They found false positives exceeded true positives by three to one. So there are many false positives, many alerts that were, that were not true. And they felt from a review of the literature that there are was no good evidence that neurological, neurological injury and paralysis um, was avoided from what was done during the surgery. So in other words, it just, it just wasn't proven that what was done during the surgery made any difference to the outcome. Now, the problem that I have with this argument is that it's an argument from ignorance. In other words, you can't prove something and therefore you don't know if it's true or not. Um, uh, I, I think the study that needs to be done is basically a, a blinded study where there is neuromonitoring and the surgeon is not told the results of the neuromonitoring. But the problem with this is that you would have to sit by and watch an injury occur as a technician without telling the surgeon. So for me, it would be like flying a helicopter and the co-pilot cannot tell the pilot what the gauges say and they just let the helicopter crash. So I think to do an evidence-based level one randomized study for this topic is probably impossible. The problem with all these false positives is you're trying to perform a surgery which is very delicate and serious. At the same time, you have this fire alarm going off in the corner telling you that there's a serious problem when you know there's probably a 25% chance that it's true. <coughs> Nevertheless, neuromonitoring is serious repercussions and definite litigation risks, um, the, the rewards for these type of uh, injuries are very high in the millions of dollars. Uh, a nice review can be found by the University of Baltimore Law Review 2016. This is a review of the University of Washington, Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri experience of 12,000 patients from 1985 to 2010. And this study the authors felt that they decreased their uh, possible injury uh, percentage from 3% to 0.1%. Um, almost a quarter of these cases were cervical, and the changes they did were uh, changing the instrumentation, changing the positioning of the patient, changing the correction of the deformity, systemic problems, unknown problems, focal cord problems. So they felt that after reviewing 12,000 patients with neuromonitoring, that neuromonitoring helped significantly. This is a Canadian study published in Journal of Neurosurgery 2019, retrospective, reviewing 141,000 ACDF cases from 2000 to 2009 to 2013. And they found that there was no change in the outcome of patients undergoing ACDF surgery, whether they had neuromonitoring or not. In other words, it didn't make a difference if they were monitored as far as outcome is concerned. They also found that risk factors for neurological injury were age, uh, over 65 years, multi-level fusions, patients with comorbidities, and w whether they were admitted for neurological problem or it was elective. In this study of 
Pediatric Deformities, July 2018, Journal of Spine. It was found that 20% of the neuromonitoring improved after just elevating the blood pressure. So basically, the mean arterial pressure was raised from 72 to 86 millimeters. This improved the neuromonitoring in 20% of cases. Uh, this is always the first step for me, and usually my baseline is I tell the anesthesiologist just to keep the patient at the systemic, uh, at, the, at the blood pressure that they usually live, where they usually live. This article is the role of uh, neuromonitoring in metastatic spine tumor surgery from Singapore. They found 10% of the time they had alerts, and these are basically the responses they did. And they felt that it was effective in reversing the alerts, reversing the neuromonitoring changes, and therefore avoiding neurological injury. Uh, this article is from Tel Aviv, uh, Israel, World Neurosurgery, published March 2019 this year. Just cervical cases, 468 cervical cases. Uh, the authors here found that um, a third of the time the neuromonitoring changes were from head positioning uh, and 47% of the time from decompression. And the authors here felt that the neuromonitoring helped significantly in reversing the neurological findings from the SSCP in the monitoring and therefore avoiding neurological injury. But again, this doesn't prove that the steps that were taken to reverse the neuromonitoring actually led to a different outcome. But, but that's just never been proven one way or another. So this is just back to our case, C57 ACDF. We flexed the neck slightly, the neuromonitoring improved, and we went forwards with a C5, C7 ACDF. And these are the post-op x-rays one month out. The patient woke up completely fine, symptoms completely better. And you can see interestingly that the C4, C5 spondylolisthesis is not present, and the patient can't hold her head up better than pre-op probably because her stenosis and her painful problem has now been fixed surgically. The patient did very well post-op. Thanks for joining Spun Conference.